Welcome to Unstoppable Female Entrepreneurs, where business expert and success coach Kelsey Matheson teaches you how to massively grow your business, navigate the mind drama that's holding you back, make more money, and acquire the skills and confidence to become unstoppable. Hello, my friends. I hope you are all healthy and happy. You are listening to Unstoppable Female Entrepreneurs, and this is episode number 14. Well, you can probably hear in my voice that I'm a little under the weather. And at the time of this recording, I am on day four of having COVID. Yes, it happened. My symptoms are are fairly mild. I kind of feel like I have a sinus cold. And I'm recording this from my bedroom where I've been hanging out for the past few days. So you may hear more of those New York City sounds in the background more than normal. So yeah, I have COVID. We're we're actually moving at the end of this month and I just launched a new program. So never a dull moment in the Matheson-McCord household. Yeah, so speaking of the Matheson-McCord household, I am obviously the Matheson and my husband is the McCord. But you might not know that we took each other's names when we got married. So my husband's legal last name is Matheson-McCord and my legal last name is Matheson McCord, and it's the same for our daughter. For me, it just felt weird to take his name when we got married. I'm I'm actually very attached to my name. And of course, back in the day, a woman would take a husband's name because, I mean, she was considered his property, right? (laughs) And so for my husband and I, we were entering a very, you know, an equal partnership, let's say. (laughs) And so at the time of our marriage, we chose to take each other's names, which was, which was really cool. And in business, of course, I'm Kelsey Matheson and my husband is a professional actor. So he's Scott McCord. But as a family, we all share the same last name, which is Matheson McCord. And, you know, that's just how we went about it. You might have taken your husband's last name and, you know, or your partner's last name, which is which is cool. And my uncle actually ended up taking my aunt's name, which was our name. He became a Matheson when they got married and he kept Matheson actually after they they uh, they got divorced. So anyway, all this to say <laughs> the Matheson McCord household has a lot going on right now. I mean, we always have a lot going on. We're a busy family, Uh, but now we're throwing a move into the mix and, you know, COVID into the mix, which was unexpected, you know, good times. So we needed to move around this time last year and friends of ours were leaving the city for a year. So they gave us the option to sublet their place, which worked out perfectly. And we knew it was only going to be temporary, but we were helping them out. They were helping us out. So it was the perfect situation for all of us. But over the holidays, my husband and I um, started looking for for a new place because we knew that this year of subletting is coming to an end. So we had to start looking for our new home. Now, ideally, we want three bedrooms and two bathrooms. Now, let me be clear that here in New York City, three bedrooms and two bathrooms isn't always easy to find. (laughs) And we're still renting here in New York. We haven't decided to buy yet. And, And look, Places are small. When you're in the big city, prices are high and space is limited. But we wanted to try and manifest something that we could stay in comfortably for the next couple of years until we maybe we do decide to buy down the road. But ideally, we also wanted to have some sort of outdoor space. You know, again, super difficult to find here in New York City. We wanted an in-unit washer and dryer and a dishwasher in the kitchen, which is important for us. And also sometimes not that easy to find here in the big city. I mean, to some of you, that might sound a little crazy. You might be thinking, well, of course your place is going to have a dishwasher and and an in-unit, you know, washer and dryer. What are you talking about? And of course you can find that, you know, you can, you can find places that have dishwashers and, and washer and dryers in New York City, but there are many, many places that that don't have in-suite laundry or dishwashers in the kitchen or both, right? You have to remember that so many of the buildings here are incredibly old, like over 100 years old. And even with the numerous renovations and upgrades that they've gone through over the years, some places still don't have all of the amenities that many of us see as just the, just this, you know, just the norm in this day and age. And I should also mention that a big deal breaker for us is that the place has to allow pets because obviously we have pets. We have a dog, we have guinea pigs. And after living here in New York City for five and a half years now in three different Brooklyn neighborhoods, we knew what we wanted in an ideal world, but we also know how important it is to practice non-attachment. So have you heard the quote from Buddha, 
that the root to all suffering is attachment? Yeah, well, some would say that it's a big ask to have three bedrooms and two bathrooms and an outdoor living space near Prospect Park and one of the three neighborhoods in Brooklyn that we like, and the place has to accept pets, (laughs) right? Now, here's the thing. Did I put it out into the universe that that's what we wanted? You bet. Did I visualize the place and meditate on what, you know, we would hope to find? Of course, absolutely. But I was also open to other options and I embraced that as well. I embraced those other options, right? If the place only has two bedrooms, that would be fine. I'd prefer to have a separate room for my office, but we can make two bedrooms work, right? We've had two bedrooms for the last uh, three years now. How about only one bathroom? Yes, we've made that work now for the last year. So not ideal, but we can work with it. No private outdoor space. Yes, that's okay. We also haven't had our own outdoor private space for the last three years. And that's why we, you know, we want to be close to the park. Would we be disappointed if we didn't get everything we wanted? Sure. But could we make it work? Yes. Now I'll get back to the story and tell you how it ends, uh, you know, in, in, in a bit, but I want to chat a little bit more about disappointment. So I just launched a new program called the Wellness Entrepreneur Accelerator. And the niche for this specific program is female entrepreneurs in the health and wellness space who are ready to start making $10,000 per month consistently. So they've been running their businesses for a while and they're making maybe $2,000, $3,000 or even $5,000 a month regularly, but they just can't seem to crack that 10K per month code, right? It's a goal that they have, but they feel like they see everyone else around them doing it but it's just not happening for them. And they're starting to think and feel that it's never going to happen for them. So I launched this program at the end of last year, um, just this past December, and I promoted an early bird price of 50% off, 50% off if you signed up before the end of the year. And my goal was to sign up three clients before December 31st. And I signed up one client in mid-December. And then after that, it was like, it was radio silence, people. (laughs) There was nothing. (laughs) There were no consultation calls. There were no private messages asking me for more information. There were no comments from people who might be interested or had questions for me about the program. And the closer it got to December 31st, the more I got discouraged. The more, and of course, the more I got discouraged, then the less action I took and the less motivated I was. Now, some of you might be thinking, yeah, but Kelsey, you launched right around the holidays. Like, that's not a great time to sell. Well, I would argue that, and my coach actually teaches us that December is a great time to sell, but maybe I'll leave that for another podcast episode. But let's just take a moment to look at that thought. If you choose to think December isn't a great time to sell, what results do you think you're going to generate? Remember the model. It's not a fact that December is a bad time to sell. You cannot prove that in a court of law. Actually, evidence would suggest the exact opposite with all the gift giving celebrations and bonuses and the inspiration and motivation to shop and spend money during that time of the year. So if you choose to think that December is a bad time to sell, what feelings will that generate? If you think December is a bad time to sell, will you feel excited and motivated and energized? No, not likely. Will you generate amazing sales in your business if you're choosing to think that December is a bad time to sell? (laughs) I highly doubt it. So after December 31st came and went, I looked back at why I got discouraged. And I realized that my thought was that any extra effort won't make a difference at this point. And that led me to feel discouraged. The fact that I hadn't signed those other two people up, the fact that I had only signed one out of three people was a completely neutral circumstance. That didn't have me feeling discouraged. It was my thought that any extra effort won't make a difference. That thought led to me, uh, led to my feeling of discouragement. Does that make sense? So when I'm feeling discouraged because I'm thinking, well, any extra effort at this point is going to make a difference. The actions or the inactions I took were, well, I didn't go live. 
I was not creating more videos for my social media manager to use. I wasn't putting in the extra effort at the end of the year to get the message out there. And of course, I was ruminating about should I do more? I shouldn't do more, but I don't want to be pushy, but I don't want to, you know, be lazy. And look, the emails and the social media part posts are already being scheduled. So that should be enough. I really shouldn't, you know, there's no point to doing more. Um, anyways, ruminating all about that because I was feeling discouraged because I was thinking any extra effort is not going to make the difference at the po- at this point. So <laughs> what do you think my results were? Well, I didn't put in any extra effort. So I proved to myself that it wouldn't make a difference. And I didn't give myself a chance to make a difference because I didn't put in the additional like oomph into the launch at the end of the year. But here's the real lesson. I was more attached to the result of signing up two more clients than I was to my why. Do you see that? If I was more attached to my why, then I would have shown up differently. I would have chosen thoughts that would have served my mission to help more female entrepreneurs make their first $100,000. Because if I had gone live a few more times, if I had made more content for my social media manager, then who knows how that would have served the women that I am meant to serve. Does it mean that two more clients would have signed up before the strike of midnight on New Year's Eve? I don't know. It actually doesn't matter. What matters is that when my why drives my actions, It will always serve my business, no matter what. So here's the second part of this equation. Like the first part is the non-attachment. The second part is that I have to allow myself to feel disappointment. It's okay to be disappointed. It's human. As entrepreneurs, we are constantly working towards achieving our goals. And sometimes we'll accomplish them. And sometimes we're going to land flat on our face. And most of the time, it's somewhere in the middle. (laughs) Look, I've built multiple seven-figure businesses, and I still go through the doubt demons telling me that I'm not good enough. I still go through thinking that no one is interested in what I have to offer. I still go through feelings of disappointment, and that's okay. What we don't want to do is get stuck in indulgent emotions that keep us stuck. And we don't want to ignore, avoid, or resist the feelings or the emotions of disappointment or worthlessness or whatever's coming up for you when things don't go as planned. I say this a lot to my clients. We need to sit in our shit. When the shit comes up and you feel disappointed or you feel worthless, you got to sit in it. And I know it's not the nicest image, but you need to bring awareness to it. You need to acknowledge it. And then you need to accept it. It's the three A's, awareness, acknowledgement, acceptance. When most of us start to feel the disappointment or we start to feel the feelings of worthlessness, we want to avoid it and move on to something more productive or more positive. But in doing so, we suppress what came up to be processed and it doesn't go away when we ignore it. It stays there. It festers. It waits to come up again, to surface again when something else doesn't go as planned. And the more we ignore it, the more it keeps us stuck. But when we bring awareness to it, like for example, we consciously think, oh, okay, here I am. The thing didn't go the way that I wanted and I'm feeling disappointed and I'm feeling that I can't do anything right and I'm feeling like a total failure. And then you acknowledge it, you breathe into it. Okay, where do those feelings live in your body? What does it feel like in your body? Does it feel like butterflies? Does it feel heavy? Does it feel gross? Is there a color associated to the feeling? Do you have any memories that surface or are, that are maybe associated with these emotions? And then accept it. It's okay that a part of you feels like a failure. It's okay that there's a part of you that feels totally worthless. Look, there's a part of you that is strong and there's a part of you that is weak. There's a part of you that feels empowered and there's a part of you that feels like you can't do anything right. And that's okay, because guess what? You're human. Accept that about yourself. And then from that place of acceptance, you can process the emotions and move forward. So over the next couple of months, I'm continuing to launch my program for female wellness entrepreneurs who are ready to start making 10K per month consistently in their business. And 
(laughs) we're going to be moving at the beginning of February into our new home, that does in fact have three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a dishwasher, in-suite washer and dryer, is pet friendly, and has an amazing roof deck with a gorgeous view of New York. It's all happening. (laughs) Now, I wasn't attached to that outcome like I was attached to signing up those two additional clients. I knew there was a strong possibility of not finding a place like that. And if we didn't, I was willing to sit in the disappointment and process those emotions. I was so open to us not finding a place like that because I did the self-coaching on it. I did the self-coaching specifically on non-attachment. I didn't want to be shackled by it. And of course, I'm so grateful that we found this place. I'm so grateful I'll have my own office. Um, we love the neighborhood. There's just so many things about it to be, to be excited about. Just like there are so many things to be excited about my new program. Will I keep setting goals for myself to serve more people and to move the needle on my business and to promote the Wellness Entrepreneur Accelerator to sign more clients? Yes, of course. But my intention is to be attached to my why. Why am I excited about this program? Why do I know deep within me, like to the core of my being, that this program is going to serve so many women and I don't necessarily know the timeline? So my intention is to be attached to my why as I move forward in the pursuit of my goals, right? In the pursuit of signing up more clients. Was I disappointed? Let's talk about disappointment in terms of getting COVID. Was I disappointed when I got COVID? Yes, totally. And I've had to process those feelings as well. But my symptoms are mild. You know, I'm grateful for that. I'm taking good care of myself, right? Taking it day by day. But remember, when you recognize you have a feeling of attachment to something, it's a sign that there's work that needs to be done. There's self-coaching that needs to be done. Or I'm taking it to my coach, right? To talk to my coach about it. It's so interesting that I could have non-attachment in one area and be so attached in another I was able to process the disappointment in one area of my life, but the disappointment was keeping me stuck in another area of my life. But I brought awareness to it and then I acknowledged it and then I accepted it. Because when the negative feelings start to surface, when things don't, don't go your way, remember the triple A's, bring awareness to it, acknowledge it and accept it. So my question for you this week is, Where in your life do you need to practice non-attachment? Is there an area in your life where you know you suffer from feelings of attachment? It might not feel like suffering, but when you're attached to something, it acts like a trap. Where in your life do you need to practice non-attachment? That's what I have for you today, my friends. Thank you for listening. (laughs) I know I sound a little like a croaky frog. (laughs) (laughs) but uh, I hope you have an amazing week and I look forward to connecting with you next time. And hopefully I will be feeling and sounding a whole lot better. (laughs) All right. Thanks again. Ciao for now. Hey, if you'd like a weekly dose of motivation, inspiration, and actionable tips to grow your business while managing all the things, then you need to get on my email list. Just head over to KelseyMatheson.com to join my list. And while you're there, check out the awesome free content I give away. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please share with other female entrepreneurs who need some love and support. And of course, if you haven't already, I would be so grateful if you subscribe, rate, and review my show on your favorite podcast player. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to connecting with you next week.